Welcome everyone to today's seminar on Malaysia's Judiciary, Challenges and Future Directions. I am Jacqueline Neal, Associate Professor and Director of the Centre for Asian Legal Studies at the National University of Singapore, Faculty of Law. Now today's seminar is organised under the auspices of our Comparative Public Law Cluster, one of four research clusters at the centre. The other research clusters are comparative commercial law, comparative civil law traditions, and law and religion in Asia. Now, our research classes represent the focal points of our work at the center and are coordinated by colleagues who are prominent scholars in their respective fields. The comparative public law cluster is coordinated by Kevin Tan, who is moderating today's seminar, as well as our colleague, Tio Lian. Now, I'm especially pleased for our center to co-organize today's event with the Australian National University's Malaysia Institute. Now, this is more than a timely collaboration on a topic of great significance as the judicialization of politics becomes increasingly evident across Asia, including in Malaysia. And so when Bjorn Dressel and Ross Tepsel proposed this collaborative effort to organize the seminar, it would have been impossible and in fact foolish to say no. So thank you, Bjorn and Ross. I'll now hand over the time to Ross to say a few words about the Malaysia Institute at ANU before Kevin starts the session proper. Ross. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you to the Center for Asian Legal Studies um, and the, the team there for their wonderful work. I'm Ross Tapsell, the director of the ANU Malaysia Institute. The Malaysia Institute was established in, in 2016 um, in order to build on a long history of Malaysian studies at the Australian National University and our aims are to collaborate on uh, Malaysian studies and politics and society um, with institutions in the region and indeed globally in order to promote and uh, enhance the study of Malaysia. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the update our website is about the uh, institute our website is malaysiainstitute.anu.edu.au um, we actually have an update conference coming up from the 21st to the 23rd of October, which has a political update, an economic update, and a cultural update with distinguished speakers um, from Malaysia speaking at that event. So we'd love to see you there as well. Um, as Jacqueline said, this is a collaboration with uh, NUS, and uh, I'd like to, to thank NUS and also Bjorn for, for their work. Uh, Bjorn Dressel at ANU is uh, a distinguished associate professor and, and a, a scholar of Southeast Asia, and his work is part of a DFAT funded program. Um, it's called SIABO, uh, the aim of which is to support democratic values and institutions in Southeast Asia. Um, so we've run a number of research projects via the Institute to scholars at the ANU and in Malaysia and elsewhere um, to write about this topic and obviously uh, law itself is crucial to this issue of democratic values and institutions. So thanks again to everyone. I'll now hand over to Kevin uh, to start the webinar. Thanks very much, Ross. Thanks, Jacqueline. And um, welcome everybody to this webinar. My name is Kevin Tan and I teach uh, at the Faculty of Law at NUS. Uh, it's a great pleasure today to be able to be a chair of this webinar with three old friends. Uh, let me introduce to the, you to them very briefly in their speaking order. First, of course, you've heard that um, the um, initiator of this is Bjorn. Bjorn Dressel, he will be our first speaker. Bjorn is currently the Director of Research and Impact at the Crawford School of uh, Public Policy at the Australian National University. Uh, for now almost a decade, he's been working uh, very deeply on the judicialization of politics in Southeast Asia and is the author of two books uh, on, on this. The second speaker uh, is uh, Dato Malik Imtias, uh, who's uh, very well known in, in, in legal circles in Malaysia. He is an advocate of over 20 years experience. Uh, and uh, his name can be found uh, on the law reports relating to over 200 cases, many of which involve public law. Um, finally, of course, um, uh, we have Jacqueline Neo, my colleague uh, and the director of our Center for Asian Legal Studies. Uh, Jacqueline also works on uh, Malaysian law and politics uh, and um, well, has uh, published very widely in this area. So with that, let me now uh, turn the floor over to Bjorn, uh, and uh, you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thanks everyone um, for having me today. 
uh, thanks to the Center for Asian Legal Studies, the ANU Malaysia Institute. Uh, and I should say before I get started that, of course, the little I know about Malaysia is largely from people on this panel or in the audience. You know who you are. So many, many thanks uh, for having me today and allowing me to share really uh, one of my uh, current research on the Malaysian judiciary that I've been conducting with uh, Professor Tumo Inui, uh, who is also in the audience today, um, where we try really to look um, at the Federal Court of Malaysia from a historical perspective and through an empirical lens. And so uh, I will be speaking to some slides because I'm presenting a, a few numbers and, and background, so, um, and that should be done in 15, maximum 20 minutes. So the first thing I want to say is, of course, uh, as Kevin pointed out, I've been working for a while now on some of the, what I call dramatic changes in the constitutional landscape in Southeast Asia. We see that in constitution making, but we see that also as part of uh, a broader judicialization of politics. That is to say that courts become involved in issues that are generally considered political. Um, Contestation is shaping constitutional practice in Southeast Asia. We see it currently in Thailand and the Philippines around constitutional reform. We see it in human rights. We see it in the role of the military. But perhaps less understood is the battles that are raging on around the judiciary as an institution. And my argument, um, all of us are in some ways legal scholars, but in my case, uh, I'm also passionate about political science and I'm actually working in a school of political science. Uh, what I'm always advocating for is that we need to complement the legal doctrinal scholarship, which many of you uh, do so well with a broader empirical and political perspective. And so the purpose today is to talk uh, to you about Malaysia, about the federal court from that empirical political perspective. Let me start simply by pointing out that Malaysia is somewhat understudied. And when I say that, I don't mean that legal scholarship uh, hasn't looked at Malaysia. In fact, if you live in Singapore, you want to study Malaysia. It's so much more exciting. But what I mean here is uh, from that empirical legal perspective. In many ways, when we think about the Malaysian judiciary, we often have this quote in mind from uh, Mohamed Sufyan at the time, former Lord President, in which he argued that even in a multiracial society like Malaysia, judges are impartial, they are independent, and they will just adjudicate on the law. Now, a big scholarship, political science scholarship, has always questioned these assumptions in general in the Supreme Court of the United States or at the Constitutional Court in Germany. And so our paper is really looking at patterns of decision making uh, at the court over a long period of time. And we are looking for patterns in that data. And we try to test some common assumptions and propositions that are floating around in regards to the Malaysian judiciary. I don't have to explain to uh, people what the Federal Court of Malaysia is. I just want to highlight from a comparative perspective briefly three points. One is that this is a long lasting institution. It has been created at the time as a Supreme Court uh, after independence that is unusual compared to other courts in the region who are quite new and who have been dissolved as part of the process sometimes, let's say in Thailand. Um, it's a court that um, has far reaching uh, powers and justices have to retire at a certain age. That matters because that's not like a Supreme Court of the United States where you essentially decide when you want to retire. And the performance of the court has been somewhat uneven. In some ways, it has been critical to a number of uh, mega political cases, as Ron Herschel calls it. It has been criticized for being rather restrained and formalist in its approach to constitutional law, and Jacqueline will certainly talk to that. Um, it has been highly regarded, but has been also regularly accused of politicization, occasionally of corruption, uh, and most recently uh, of political meddling. That has not stopped the court from being a court that is in high demand. In fact, it receives a high number of cases over time. Here we have some data from 2010 to 2018, and you can see that the majority of cases are really criminal appeal and civil appeal cases. But there's also a growing body of habeas corpus cases and leave applications, which sometimes, uh, as uh, Imtiaz will probably speak to, also touch on constitutional issues. So when we look now at the uh, empirical side of the court performance, I just want to highlight to all of you so that we're on the same page that we are looking at two data sets that we have put together. And these are the first 
data sets, empirical data sets on the Federal Court of Malaysia. One is a very carefully um, uh, curated data set on so-called mega political cases. These are the high profile constitutional cases that have occurred from 1960 to 2018. And the other is a sociobiographic data set, which captures 120, 102 federal court justices uh, among 73 who have who sat in these 102 mega political cases. Um, and so what we are trying to do is to read through that data as certain patterns of judicial behavior by looking at individual votes of these justices. So we have 385 observations. And we will do so, and I will take you through that briefly, through basic descriptive statistics, and then we are testing more specifically uh, four hypotheses that are based on previous literature and public commentary. The first thing to say is, I remember my friend Chandra um, uh, arguing that there is no judicialization of politics in Malaysia. Uh, that, of course, mega political cases have been slightly on the rise, but they have come in certain peaks. In other words, we have three distinct events uh, in Malaysian history where we see a peak of constitutional mega political cases coming to the court. And quite interestingly, of course, we are in a, uh, in a third peak period of some ways after um, Barisan Nacional lost its uh, absolute majority. There's a rising number of cases that have occurred since 2008. What is interesting is when we look at the bench is who gets nominated and what are some of the patterns of these uh, federal court justices. I mean, first of all, to point out that two prime ministers have been very prominent in their appointment um, uh, their appointments to the bench, that is uh, Mahathir's first government, which lasted for a long time and has appointed 31 justices, and Najib Razak also appointing 25 justices to the bench, a bench that has traditionally been quite male dominated, that's not unusual in Asia, uh, but interestingly enough, that trend is now changing, uh, and I will come back to this a bit later. Um, similarly, quite interesting is to point out that we have um, a bench that has traditionally been dominated by education pathways abroad. And I'm thinking here particularly about the British institutions and access to the bar there. And more recently, we see justices who are coming through the Malaysian system, particularly through the University of Malaya. Uh, again, uh, a quite prominent trend, however, in the most recent appointments, not as visible. What is also quite interesting is that most of the justices are career justices. That is probably normal for Commonwealth jurisdictions, but it's not so normal when we look around at other constitutional and high courts in the region. Uh, and likewise, and I will talk to this in a minute, of course, you know, a bench that has somewhat oscillated around, uh, you know, the percentages distribution in terms of ethnic background. As a matter of fact, when we look at the bench over time, we can see a, a, a shift from foreign justices, these are British and New Zealand justices at time of independence, to an indigenized bench, and a peak of Malay justices um, and around the period of 2000 to 2009, uh, and now becoming somewhat more, um, somewhat more balanced in, in recent periods. That said, the Federal Court of Malaysia, compared to the other superior courts, that is the Court of Appeal and the High Court, has always had a uh, a distinctly higher number of Malay justices on the bench than in comparison to the other superior courts. And that's something that's also quite interesting to see now in the most recent appointments from 2019 to, 2000, uh, to 2020. What is also quite interesting to remember is that justices in Malaysia retire as they should. Um, now you would say that's normal, that's how it should be done. Uh, but keep in mind, um, in many jurisdictions around the region, that is not the case. Uh, and what is also quite interesting, of course, is that with the exception of 1988, we only see three dismissals and three suspensions at the time. So it's a quite organized and coherent way of leaving the bench. In our analysis, and I think that's something worth remembering, what we see is that the proportion of anti-government votes have over time declined. In other words, almost 60% of decisions in the beginning of the court in the 1960s and 70s went against the government. That number has consistently declined, is now a little bit again on the rise, but it's a very low number of cases that are decided at the federal court level against the government. What's probably even more worrisome is uh, 
that the dissent on the bench, that is the ability of justices to dissent from their peers, from the majority opinion, uh, is also rapidly declining. That could be interpreted as becoming a bench that is becoming more homogeneous, or it can also uh, be interpreted maybe as a bench that in some ways uh, is facing certain pressures. This is more for the internal gossip of those who are really interested in the Malaysian judiciary. Here we listed some of the top dissenters and top voters for the government. And for those of you who are quite familiar uh, with Malaysia, you might find some expected names here. Some of them are former chief justices, uh, quite close to the government. And some of them, like Richard Malanjum, uh, recent chief justice known to be a relatively independent mind and one of the highest dissenters uh, on the bench. Now, what we have done finally, and I will not bother you with the details of the numbers, is to test for four common assumptions when we talk about the judiciary in Malaysia. One is the general perception that the bench after 1988, after the judiciary crisis, looked very different, that judges have become more deferential to government. We call it the 1988 generational impact. One is the so-called strategic defection, that is to say a justice closer to retirement is more likely to vote against the government than when he's appointed to the bench. One is to look for an ethnic or religious pattern of voting, arguing that judges of non-Malay background, like Indian, Chinese, or indigenous, might be more likely than those of Malay background to vote against the government. And finally, a very common hypothesis in the study of judicial behavior is that someone who's appointed by the prime minister show some degree of loyalty to the prime minister and as a result will vote for uh, the prime minister, the so-called loyalty thesis. And I'm gonna go in my last five minutes quickly through each of these uh, hypotheses and try to prove to you that some might hold up or might not hold up. Uh, this is a probit regression analysis and my co-author can also speak to that if needed. The first point really to make is that there seems to be a clear pattern here that justices appointed after 1988 are distinct in their behavior. They are more likely to cast a pro-government vote at a marginal effect rate of 26% than those that have been appointed before 1988. That's something uh, quite important and I think it would match probably the perception of many practitioners uh, in Malaysia. The second hypothesis we tried to follow was the strategic defection hypothesis and that has not been confirmed. In other words, a justice who is coming to the end of his term or her term is not likely to vote against the government more often than a justice um, who is not coming to the end of the term. In other words, that might be explained with the long-standing uh, single party rule in Malaysia, where a lot of times, you know, the career trajectory of a justice might also be uh, still determined after retirement. Um, ethnicity and religion, these are of course conflating variables. Uh, often a Malay background also means a certain religion. Uh, in some ways, we find some confirmation. A Muslim justice is more likely to vote for the government than a non-Muslim justice. Uh, that is a probability of pro-vote increases by almost 12%. That's quite interesting in our data set, I should say. Uh, that's always important to remember. And the fourth hypothesis, the loyalty to the appointing prime minister was also confirmed, uh, where we found essentially that those um, appointed by the prime minister are also more likely to vote uh, for the appointing uh, prime minister when his government is, is in power. What is also quite interesting uh, to, to note, uh, although not statistically significant, is that female justices are more likely to vote against government than their male peers. And that's probably an interesting finding in the sense that the bench currently has become a much more gender balanced. Um, in fact, eight out of the 14 justices are currently female. Uh, and we also see no significant difference across case types. And that's often what practitioners would tell me. They would say, isn't there a sharp difference between, let's say, civil liberty cases and executive prerogative cases? In our data set, we couldn't confirm or disconfirm that there are differences between uh, case types. In fact, we don't find any significant difference. And what is also quite surprising, I expected that, is that there is no marginal effect for overseas training. There's often a narrative in Malaysia that says the all generation of justices has been trained overseas. They come back with ideas from Britain, the United States, Australia, and they are distinct in their decision-making. In our data set, we don't find evidence of that, but it will be interesting to see 
uh, when we extend this data set, because as you know, the most recent justices appointed in 2020 were all trained overseas. Sorry, two out of the three. So let me conclude then, because I'm a bit limited for time and we can visit all of these uh, things again. I would conclude that the federal court, a traditionally and comparatively restrained institution, is one that is increasingly engaged in the judicialization of politics. We have to reckon and acknowledge this. And it's as such quite critical to the governance and the rule of law in Malaysia. Um, second, when we look at the patterns on the bench over a long period of time, we see a decline in anti-government votes, the willingness to take on the government, and we see a decline in the disagreement on the bench. That is coinciding with less ethnic and religious diversity on the bench over time, and in particular in comparison to the other superior courts, the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Finally, in terms of the drivers of judicial behavior in these cases, in our data set, we find a validation for many of the public perceptions, in particular to the role of ethnicity, religion, loyalty to the appointer, and the post-1980 generational voting pattern. If we look ahead, and this is something that I will leave to the debate, I'm not going to answer this, and Jacqueline and Imtiaz are going to talk to this, I'm sure. Uh, of course, there are discussions nowadays in the period since 2010 of a court that tries to gradually reassert itself. And I know that Jacqueline might be talking to this in terms of the basic structure doctrine. There are discussions uh, we might want to have about political fragmentation increasing and, as the literature often suggests, also inducing greater independence to the court. But one might also ask, and, and, and wonder whether this is not going to introduce greater politicization uh, of the court. Um, we might also see a post BN effect in terms of greater diversity of justices being appointed to the bench. And that's quite important because in some ways it draws attention to the role of the Judicial Appointments uh, Commission and their ability to, to ensure greater diversity uh, of the bench. And finally, and we shouldn't forget about this, there's also new judicial leadership and perhaps new reform momentum. We saw this starting under Chief Justice Malanjum, but it's certainly continuing under current Chief Justice Maimun Tuan Mat, uh, which um, is doing some exciting things about reducing backlog of cases, mobile courts, etc., which I think are all worthwhile uh, keeping in mind when we think ahead about the route of the Malaysian judiciary. So on that note, let me finish. Um, and always happy to answer questions. But I guess for the time being, I hand over back to Kevin. Thanks very much, Bjorn. Uh, what we will do in this session is that we'll take questions right at the end after everybody has spoken. And uh, to do that, to facilitate that, you will find that there's a Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom bar. So please use that uh, as a means of communicating your questions to us. Uh, you can either address the questions to the panel generally or to a specific speaker. And what I will do towards the end is that I will collate these speak, uh, questions that you have posed and then direct them to the various speakers. So please make use of that feature uh, in Zoom, all right? We won't be taking uh, uh, sort of verbal questions as such. So with that, let me turn the floor over now to Jacqueline. I made a mistake. Uh, it was Jacqueline who was meant to speak uh, before Imtia. So Jacqueline, you have the floor. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Bjorn, for um, that for setting us off with these insights, uh, with the empirical analysis that tests some of our assumptions about judicial decision making in the federal court. And I think that some of these factors that you have identified that correlate to some decision making trends for individual judges on the court provide, I suppose, uh, important questions for judicial reform. That's sort of not what I'm going to talk on, talk about in my session. Um, what I'm going to look at is um, the sort of role in which some of these cases have had in um, setting out the jurisprudential um, trends and approaches within the federal court. Now, I think that of the 102 cases that Bjorn and Tomo studied, besides the elections cases, which tend to be deeply political, Another area of law that has become deeply politicized in Malaysia is actually religion. In Bjorn and Tumo's uh, data set, they identified 12 religion cases in which 92% of these cases were held in the government's favor. 
This compares, I suppose, with cases involving civil liberties, where out of 38 cases, only 74% were held in the government's favor. Now, I take the point about how um, you don't see significant dif difference in your conclusions across case types, but that's, I suppose, not what we are looking at. What I'm looking at is the impact of these religion cases and to provide, I suppose, propose that religion cases have to be studied distinctively because of the politicization involved and the fact that they tend to be heavily contested in Malaysia. In some cases, you have people demonstrating outside the courts um, in favor of one or the other position. And so I think religion cases have to be studied distinctively as even sui generis and it could even be regarded as an important linchpin in advancing constitutionalism as a matter of government limited by a constitution and protective of fundamental liberties. So, and I will uh, also explain that this is because constitutional challenges involving religion have become closely intertwined with judicial power and that as courts assert greater judicial power as an independent institution, this could have this could be, and it has to be, seen through the lenses of these religion cases. Now, it's important to remember that many of these contested religion and religious freedom cases, particularly the conversion of Islam cases, really occurred in sort of post-1988 judicial crisis. It post-states the control, controversial amendment on judicial power in the Constitution. Because in that constitutional amendment, besides the removal of explicit reference to judicial power in the federal constitution, the amendment inserted a provision 1A to Article 1 to 1, which states that the high courts shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. Now, this is one of the most controversial and heavily litigated uh, provision in the constitution. Now, Although the amendment came about in the late 1980s, it was only in the late 1990s that a jurisprudential shift came about. So this is very interesting. Prior to this, in cases like in Ng Wan Chan versus Majlis Ugama Islam Wilaya Persekutuan um, in 1991, the High Court continued to guard its jurisdiction jealously, holding out against arguments like the doctrine of implied jurisdiction. Now, the, this doctrine of implied jurisdiction is the idea that as long as a matter could fall within the jurisdiction of the Sharia court, having to do with Muslim personal law, potentially having to do with Muslim personal law, the high courts would not have any jurisdiction, even if there was no explicit statutory endowment of such jurisdiction. So, granted, Ng Wan Chan was a high court case. Now, it was in the 1999 case of Sun Singh uh, versus Patubohan Kebajikan Islam Malaysia, Kada, that the federal court decided that even when state enactments did not explicitly endow jurisdiction upon the Sharia court, jurisdiction can be implied. So accepting this doctrine of implied jurisdiction. So this means that even if state enactments do not say that Sharia courts have jurisdiction, the high courts will simply say, we don't have jurisdiction because it's a matter concerning Islam. Now, this has had significant impact on religious freedom for Muslims who wish to convert out of Islam, because now they have to go to the Sharia court to obtain supposed certification of their status as no longer a Muslim. This is notwithstanding that in some cases, the Sharia court may not hear the application for want of statutory endowment of such jurisdiction, or that the, the statute may even impose certain forms of penalties for attempted conversion. Now, drawing from sort of this focus uh, in Bjorn and Tumo's work on personalities, I think it's interesting to note that the same High Court judge who decided Ng Wan Chan against implied jurisdiction set in the Sun Sing case as Chief Justice ruling for implied jurisdiction. Now, Sun Singh became, I suppose, a jurisprudential basis for one of Malaysia's most internationally renowned case for which Malik Imtiaz gained great fame, or some would say infamy, appearing on the pages of the New York Times. 
Now, the case of Lena Joy won its way through the courts in the early 2000s and ended up in the federal court in 2007. And many of you know about this case, so I'll not go into too much detail. But the point here is that the court endorsed the National Registration Department's requirement that an applicant who had converted out of Islam produced documentary evidence from the Sharia court certifying that she has renounced Islam. Now, the federal court reasoned that it's reasonable to require proper documentary evidence to support the accuracy of her contention that she was no longer a Muslim, as it was a matter of Islamic law. And so in doing so, the federal court skirted around the question of religious freedom, subordinated the constitutional right to religious freedom to the requirements of religion. Now, interestingly, the dissenting judge issued a strong judgment arguing that the majority had completely misconstrued the meaning of a constitutional right as a fundamental right. He held that the implementation of the policy has a bearing on the applicant's fundamental constitutional right to freedom of religion, and this right must be given a priority. He says that a determination simply on the basis of Wensbury and reasonableness will not be sufficient. And so in matters of fundamental rights, there cannot be implied jurisdiction. As the judge puts it, no court or all authority should be easily allowed to have implied powers to curtail rights constitutionally granted. Again, an interesting sort of tidbit here is that the dissenting judge in this case was Richard Melanjom, who later went on under the Harapan government, as um, Bjorn has already mentioned, to become Chief Justice, although for only a short period before he retired as constitutionally required. Now, he was also one of the judges that Bjorn and Tumut identified as having ruled against the government more than 30% of the time. Now, obviously, all of these restrictive readings of the religious freedom guarantee in the Constitution is very much tied to a more extensive interpre interpretation of the provision in the federal Constitution that declares Islam to be the religion of the Federation. Now, this provision was initially meant, based on the original intent, to be narrow and circumscribed and symbolic in nature. However, in the last two decades, Article 3.1 has been given what I call transformative effect and been used to change the legal meaning of the Malaysian constitution, including to restrict religious freedom protections under the constitution. Now, more recent cases have given some cause for celebration for advocates of religious freedom. The case of Indira Gandhi. Uh, was a much awaited one. The federal court quashed the conversion certificates of three minor children on the basis that the constitution requires the consent of both parents, not just one parent, for conversion of minors. Um, this is under Article 12.4 of the federal constitution, which states that the religion of a person under the age of 18 years shall be decided by his parent or guardian. Now, this decision is an important vindication of the applicant's rights as a parent. Um, but it is furthermore significant because the federal court asserted for the first time since 1999 that it retained jurisdiction to determine legal questions concerning matters of religious status of Muslim converts, departing from the Sun Singh and Lina Joy line of cases, calling them unduly simplistic, thus rejecting implied jurisdiction. Now, it's also important that here we see the intertwining of religion, religious freedom uh, interpretation with judicial power. Here, the court said that this assertion that we cannot have implied jurisdiction is simply vindicating judicial power as part of the basic structure of the constitution and this judicial power cannot be abrogated from the civil courts or conferred upon the Sharia courts, whether by constitutional amendment, act of parliament, or state legislation. Now, Indira Gandhi is significant, therefore, not just for recognizing the equal right of parents over the, over the religion of their minor children, implicating religious freedom questions, but also for the asserted restoration of this proper hierarchy between the civil court and the Sharia courts. Now it's couched as restoring judicial power and the autonomy of courts from the other branches of government. And so the federal court states that the power of judicial review is essential to the constitutional role of the courts, inherent in the basic structure. 
So we see here that the basic structure doctrine is very much being reasserted and being brought out to restore constitutional power and the status of the federal court as an independent institution. And implicated in this, or rather it is significant that the relig that religion is the, is the basis, is the focal point in which this is occurring. Now, um, this case obviously um, is significant and has been lauded for its bold reassertion of judicial power. But the tussle over jurisdictional boundaries and religious freedom still remains. And so we still need to see what the federal court will do with this reassertion of its judicial power. Because curiously, one month after it issued its judgment in Diragani, a slightly different bench ruled that Sarawak Sharia Court had jurisdiction over the application by former Muslims to be officially recognized as Christians. That said, we're kind of seeing a perhaps a state of flux. The federal court has also made certain rulings that may suggest a return to a more reasoned, legalistic approach to religion cases. Earlier this year, it overruled the Court of Appeal in another long-awaited controversy to follow state statutory rules that prohibit illegitimate children of Muslim parents from taking on their father's name in their birth certificate, the Bin Abdullah case. But what's interesting, it did so by rejecting the National Registration Department's approach of simply adopting a fatwa by the National Fatwa Committee to use Bin Abdullah for all illegitimate children. The court said, well, this fatwa is not applicable across the states. But they relied on a statute a state enactment to make its determination. Now, in another sort of case to watch, the federal court recently granted Sisters in Islam leave to continue challenge against a Selangor law allowing Sharia courts to decide on judicial reviews. So, in conclusion, in my view, that religion cases should be regarded distinctively because at its core, these cases have become fundamental to judicial power in Malaysia and would be key in advancing fundamental liberties and constitutionalism in Malaysia. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jacqueline. Uh, do keep the questions coming. And now uh, let me uh, invite uh, Imtias uh, to round up. Imtias. All right. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, and thank you to everyone else um, for the, the information. Um, so I have 10 minutes, and I'm going to try and do this really quickly. Um, so let me just deal with the situation um, uh, as I see it, where the judiciary is concerned um, in, in, uh, at the present time. So I think, I think it's safe to say that um, post-2018 May, um, which you know, by all accounts is a watershed moment for Malaysia, uh, there have been significant changes um, that have happened or occurred uh, within the, um, in the judiciary as an institution, and more particularly within the, the federal court as the Supreme Court of the country. Um, I think Bjorn's already mentioned uh, the fact of gender diversity. Um, and we now have a, a situation where the two top judges of the country are Malay Muslim women, uh, which you know, not too long ago would have been an unheard of proposition. Um, and I think it's, it's um, um, brought some strength in, in a way to the judiciary uh, in the way that diversity does. Um, starting with uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Richard Melandrum, um, uh, and here I have to disagree slightly with uh, Bjorn, um, um, there was a willingness, I think, to uh, accept dissenting views. Uh, and this was a marked shift because the previous Chief Justice, um, uh, Chief Justice Rouse, was perceived as preferring that the court spoke with one voice. Uh, Richard was not um, so constrained and in fact encouraged uh, the federal court judges to um, express their views as they saw them. And um, I think he recognized that there was a need for the expression of uh, different views to reflect the fact that uh, constitutionalism could not be seen as being um, uh, a single plane discussion, uh, single, single plane a subject of discussion, uh, and that there was a necessity to maybe perhaps through the judges uh, bring out the uh, diversity in that discussion in a way that you can see happening um, in the US, in the UK, and, uh, and other jurisdictions. 
And um, this, I think, was uh, shown by his direction that, um, at least during his tenure, all significant constitutional challenges before the federal court would be heard by a bench of nine judges. And, and um, that's the first of those cases was this case called JRI, resources, which I happen to argue uh, for the challenger, um, where we were, um, where, where, the, where the proposition before the court was that a certain legislative pr provision uh, uh, in a federal law, uh, which allowed um, uh, the central bank to determine whether certain transactions were complying with Sharia law for the purpose of Islamic banking, was um, in violation of the uh, basic structure uh, recognition of judicial independence and judicial power. Um, uh, the bench was split and interestingly we had a five to four decision against and in the minority was the Chief Justice, the Chief Judge of Malaya, the Chief Justice of Sabah, Chief Judge of Sabah and Sarawak and the Federal Court Judge who is now uh, the serving Attorney General. All four of whom were seen as very very um, strong judges uh, who sort of led the discussions in the federal court. But notwithstanding, you had um, uh, five other judges uh, say that this, they disagreed for one reason or the other. Now, that decision, I think, was very interesting for us because we saw, um, for the first time, uh, the means to recognize how it is that each particular judge on the federal court perhaps had their own legal philosophy. Much as you would see in the US, um, a conservative judge or a liberal judge Obviously, the situation in Malaysia is a little bit more nuanced, but you know it was the beginning of that sort of, um, of, of experience for us, which was a first. Um, and we've seen the dissenting uh, judges, uh, dissenting opinions uh, come fast and furious, even under Maimun. And it's not surprising for us now to, to see the Chief Justice uh, in a dissenting position, in a minority view, quite regularly. And the Chief Justice doesn't seem to have a problem with it, and I'm happy about that because it at least allows us to understand more clearly the thinking of the bench on matters of um, importance, um, core public policy issues. So that, that's, I think, been a really, uh, really good thing. And I, I don't think you can disregard the, um, the elements that um, Richard Malanjum and uh, uh, Tenku Maimun have brought as Chief Justices, because um, the Chief Justice does, in a way, set the tone of the, of the court. And I think that's, that's been very, very good. Uh, we've also seen perhaps a shift away from, um, and, and I won't say that there was political in interference before, but the bench is now acting in a way that suggests that there is no such political interference. Um, and I think one of the clearest examples of that for me um, was the series of decisions of the uh, Apex Court on the Najib Razak challenges. Um, and you know, given, given the, the situation in Malaysia, um, February this year, uh, the government, the Pakatan Harapan government collapsed. We had a, a, well, an UMNO in effect government come in with uh, Muhyiddin in um, Bursatu. The expectation was that the, perhaps the Najib Razak cases might go away, as some might, might wish. But you know, as you can see, for the SRC judgment, it was a, it was a stunning indictment of all the things that um, a premier should not be doing as a premier. And in the, same, in the same, I guess, sequence of, of uh, judgments, you, you also see that the federal court um, uh, um, unanimously uh, overturned the court of appeal decision that says that you can't sue the prime minister for misfeasance in public office. So you've had a, a series of decisions being handed down by, by the current court uh, that has in many ways uh, rebuilt or has, has, has gone some way in rebuilding uh, confidence in the institution and um, I think that's going to be something that will, will carry on uh, for, for the next few years. In, uh, perhaps, be well, particularly because uh, Tenku Maimun is, I think, 61 this year. Retirement age is 66 plus six months. Uh, so she has a good five years uh, to entrench her policy perspectives on the court. And she's aided by a, a number of judges who similarly share um, the ideas of constitutional diversity um, and why who play significant roles in developing the case law of the court at the moment. Uh, and one, one judge that comes to mind um, is uh, Justice Nalini Padmanadan, who is, I think, a judge to watch. Um, and um, what we've also seen 
more recently is a willingness now for the federal court to grant leave where it sees opportunities to develop the law. And so what we're seeing is a less formulaic application of the permission rules for appeals to be brought up to the federal court because I think there is greater awareness now that the, the state of the, the law or the case law in Malaysia requires some sort of reset, some sort of uh, survey to re-establish principles in, in a way that the court recognizes. And you know, um, coincidentally, we've got a decision um, on scandalizing contempt against internet inter intermediary spending. Um, the judiciary, uh, well, the attorney general took out applications for contempt against Malaysia Kini for having allowed third party comments that were disparaging of the judiciary. And so that led to a very um, highly publicized uh, proceeding in the federal court uh, where I think possibly the Malaysian court is now the first to, to deal with the question of whether or not publications by third parties on internet intermediaries can be made the subject of contempt in, in this way. I do recognize there's been an earlier Indian Supreme Court where Twitter was held not to be liable uh, for having uh, allowed the publication of two offensive tweets. But I, the situation there is a little bit different because here you actually had an, uh, an online uh, media house um, uh, allowing for third party comments which were uploaded automatically by artificial intelligence. Um, and it's brought into question the, 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 the relevance of takedown policies for us. Um, and, and for me, arguing that case, for Malaysia Kini, it, it was interesting to see the judges struggling with this idea, but a more traditional idea of how one pays respects to the institution or how it defers to the institution, as opposed to um, uh, uh, the modern setting of where um, the question of control, uh, oversight, and internet freedom um, has caused, uh, has, has required a need to step back perhaps and, and reevaluate. So I think on the whole, um, I would say that uh, the progress is encouraging. Um, and Jacqueline mentioned the uh, Sisters in Islam challenge. Uh, the federal court just gave leave on that to challenge fatwas, um, which I think is interesting um, because the, the state of Slangor has attempted to vest the Sharia courts with powers of judicial review uh, to sort of further and entrench that division between the Islamic courts and the civil courts. So that's good. We've also had a leave application allowed um, uh, by a challenge by a Malay individual on whether or not the Sharia law can criminalize same-sex uh, acts. Um, and um, the court has said, yes, um, we think we should hear this because under Malaysian law, criminal law uh, is a matter for the federal uh, legislature, legislative body and not the state where the Sharia laws are made. Okay, so, but I see that I've got one minute left. Um, I would just say in terms of progressing forward, and I might have to ask for one extra minute if you don't mind, Kevin. Um, uh, I think the two issues that should be addressed, and perhaps we lost the opportunity to address them during the, the Pakatan uh, government, is the question of judicial appointments um, and bringing some um, uh, more, rather, independence into that process um, and, a more, and more transparency. Um, I think the judicial appointments process is key to the future of the country. And, um, and I think it needs some, some serious consideration to ensure that there is diversity, not just gender diversity, but also racial diversity on the bench, religious diversity and, and the like. Uh, and also for an objective uh, view of, um, of um, issues of competence and, and skills. Um, you know, just, just um, uh, earlier this year, I argued a, a, a recusal application in Strava. Uh, a judicial commissioner was hearing the matter and we were concerned that because um, it concerned the Petroleum Development Act and the Prime Minister is responsible for Petronas, but he's also the, part, uh, the, the, the member of cabinet that recommends appointment. So we put it to the judicial commissioner that he should perhaps recuse because there might be a semblance of, of bias. Um, he, he dismissed the application and to be fair to him, the Court of Appeal affirmed that decision but interestingly, in his judgment, he referred to the senior judges of the judiciary as his bosses. So this question of, of what do I need to do to get promoted is something that sort of lingers at the back of, of the minds of the public as well as lawyers. And I think it, uh, the administration of justice would be better serve if we could go the, in, the route that the, that the JHC of England and Wales took, which is to make the majority of the Judicial Appointments Commission 
um, uh, non-judges or lay members. There it's actually chaired by a lay, lay person and not a judge. The other issue, and I'll just say this in passing, is the question of judicial uh, discipline or ethics. Um, I think we need to take a closer look at the mechanism for that. Uh, we have one matter now, according to media reports, going through the, the system. This, is, uh, this involves Justice Hamid Sultan uh, for having affirmed that affidavit made some public statements. So the, the process as it, as it is, a complaint is made, the Chief Justice determines whether it's uh, serious enough to warrant a tribunal, in which case she refers it or he refers it to the Attorney General. Um, if, it's not, if it does not warrant a tribunal, then it's taken internally uh, and dealt with by an ad hoc committee in camera um, uh, without any public involvement. So that raises to me certain questions about whether or not that process actually uh, meets the requirements of the independence of judiciary, more particularly because this ad hoc committee can actually suspend for up to one year. Um, and during the, the run up to, well, when the Independent Reforms Committee was meeting in Malaysia post May 2018, one of the proposals put forward was perhaps we should be looking at the New Zealand model uh, uh, under which um, um, an independent office of the uh, Judicial Conduct Commissioner has been established. And it's, it's very transparent and very accountable. Um, and it's something to look, look at. So I think these two areas are, are key areas that we need to look at to ensure that um, uh, we have the judiciary that we need. Um, and yes, and, and that's, I think, un underscored by the fact that um, that the courts now play an extremely important role in, in helping us shape the future of this country, especially in this context where we have so many different political actors uh, pushing the way they are. And, uh, and Malaysia, I think, is ready to start engaging in discussions about what our identity is as Malaysians. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Intias, uh, for giving us uh, such a good insight into what's going on on the ground right now, actually, especially since many of us actually observing from uh, not very far away, but still a distance. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one addressed to Bjorn, actually, uh, from Leon Vincent Chan. He's asking the question whether, uh, in respect of your empirical studies, um, while he says there are distinctions between outcomes by judges of different religions and of ethnicity, did the composition of each bench affect or skew the outcome of the judgments? For example, uh, for uh, some composition of each bench would be of more Malays or Muslim judges over others. So uh, did you go down to that level of looking at each uh, bench? I, I think that's uh, sort of a question relating to your data. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And I think um, I can actually take uh, Vincent's questions and, and Andrew's question together, if, if you don't uh, mind. No, no, let, let's, let's, let's do okay. Vincent's question and then we'll do, because I, I think Andrew's is, is a little bit different from, from what okay. Leon is talking about. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I mean, I think Vincent has really a point and that's a challenge for all of us who are doing empirical studies. As you know, people are appointed to the bench, people retire from the bench, so there's permanently a change of membership, if you want. And in some ways, what you could do and could try to do is always to look at a snapshot of a particular bench at a particular time. And we, we try to simulate this to a certain degree. But I guess when it comes to regression analysis, and I'm sure my, my colleague, Professor Inouye can, can jump in here as well. What we ultimately do is we look at the individual traits of a justice. And so we are asking, what is it about that justice that we can formulate as his personal individual traits? And how do, in the pattern of the data, do these individual traits help us explain a certain voting outcome? And that's essentially what we have been doing here. So we, we haven't been looking necessarily at the bench dynamics, the peer-to-peer -peer dynamics. We've been looking at the individual votes of each, each justice. Having said this, I think there is a host of new research coming out that tries precisely to map and quantify the impact of how the dynamics on the bench propel people in one direction or the other. And I think you could argue that when you share certain beliefs, whether it's political beliefs, religious beliefs, ideological or doctrinal beliefs, 
you might be closer to each other, you might listen more carefully to each other, and in some ways you might actually decide to vote more consistently as a block of, of, of um, justices. And we see that, I see that in, in the Philippines, we have, we have simulated that there, but, but I'm saying we haven't done it specifically for Malaysia. I think it would be worthwhile doing so. So good point, Vincent. Can, can I press you a little bit more on this? And this is, uh, and, and, and you know, you've said so to a number of people that I didn't quite uh, like your paper. Actually, I enjoyed the paper very much. My, my, my question has to do with how the statistics could be skewed. So, for example, one of your criteria is looking at uh, uh, the likelihood of, say, a Malay Muslim judge uh, agreeing more with the government's position than not. Now, uh, that number would be skewed depending on how many uh, such judges were appointed. I mean, if, if your majority of your bench was Malay Muslim, then obviously you're going to have much more uh, uh, judges agreeing with the government, regardless of whether they were Muslim, Malay Muslim or otherwise, right? So mm. I, I don't know if you actually took that into consideration in your... Yeah. I mean, I'm happy. I mean, first of all, I think what regression analysis always do does is it it, um, it it captures average treatment effects. So, in other words, you know, we are averaging out these effects. But if you want a really precise answer, I mean, since he has been locked in here, we can ask Professor Inui to quickly respond to that, and then we settle this once for all. Because I think a similar question is also raised by Andrew later on. Okay, Professor Inui, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you oh, very yes. well. Well, uh, thank you very much for pointing out a very important part. I mean, we analyze by using regression analysis, we analyze each individual justice's decision. So, as you have mentioned, that depending on the composition of justices on the particular bench, uh, the, uh, the voting, majority vote may be affected. But, however, because we have analyzed the decision made by each justices, not by bench as a whole, we we have we haven't uh, we haven't examined seriously about whether the decision has been um, kind of biased or not. So we just analyze each individual vote. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right, and 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 about the point that you you know just by sheer numbers, right? If your majority of your bench is Malay Muslim. Wouldn't that mean that if there were... The more uh, likely. Yeah, so, so this is what my, my, my sort of question is. I mean, I'm no statistician, but I'm just looking at it from a broad perspective. It's a numbers game, isn't it? If you have more people who, who uh, 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 sort of agree on one position, then you've got to look at what the, the numbers are, you know, ir 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 based on the variable that you're testing. But anyway, enough of my questions. Let me move on to Andrew's question. And, and I think Andrew... Uh, his, his question is a little bit different from uh, the one that was posed by Leon earlier, right? And, and Andrew says, well, for, for reasons which uh, were discussed by both uh, Jacqueline and Imtias, it seems that the, uh, on a range of issues, the federal court has recently decided important cases actually against the government. So he says, I'm puzzled why Bjorn concludes that there is a more or less downward trend. Is this a problem with the definition of what your mega political cases mean? Uh, how mega is mega? Are there not mega mega cases? Uh, I'm also puzzled why he concludes that ethnic composition and so on has not been affected when the data seems to show a surprising diversity in appointments since the institution of the Judicial Appointments Commission. Uh, is the point here that those new appointees have not yet reached the federal court level, right? So a number of sort of staggered questions. Yeah, and, and Andrew and I, we have been going over this uh, for some time now. I mean, first of all, Andrew, just as a reminder, the data set ends in 2018, yeah? So I think it would be really interesting to extend the data set to the most recent time period, uh, including 2019 and 2020, but in some ways, our data set ends in 2018. And as I said before, 
that's a trend that we have been seeing until then. And in some ways, it's understandable there, you know, after 2008 elections with the 2014 and ultimately 18 as, you know, marks of a government that is increasingly under uh, electoral pressure. And as I argued in the paper, I mean, I'm more hypothesized it because I have no evidence for it. Of course, using also the court in some ways as a mechanism to deflect some of that growing electoral uh, pressure. So I agree with you that the most recent court data um, uh, sheds a bit of a different light. In fact, I was just looking at the recent appointments at the High Court and the um, Court of Appeal, where the numbers for the Malay justices are now dropping um, to around 65% uh, at the Court of Appeal and at the High Court stable at 72%. And there's a higher number of Chinese um, and Indian justices being appointed. Now, think about it as a pipeline. This is also most likely from where you will draw for the federal court in the future. Um, similarly, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we should look at the more recent cases. I think we can go back and forth all the time about the definition what a mega political case is. I mean, our um, methodology has always been to, to look at what are the most discussed cases on the front pages of the newspaper what is mentioned in the constitutional um, textbooks as the most significant cases. And then we have a vetting process where we invite experts on the country uh, to look and, and go through that list. So I'm quite confident that our list is relatively um, safe for the analysis, so to speak. That's not to say that there might be disagreement um, on some of the cases. I mean, I think, let me just add one point, Kevin, and then I hand over to the others, um, is of course, when listening to Jacqueline and listening to Imtiaz, I mean, what becomes clear is when we do empirical analysis, as we do legal analysis, this is always one part of the story that, that we can present, right? I mean, in some ways, uh, here is a bird's eye view. We are looking at patterns in data. We are looking at certain inferential statistics that we can derive from certain individual traits, like in our case for voting. And that's not to say that someone like Jacqueline or someone like Imtias will come in and say, let's take a subset of these cases and see, you know, what kind of extremely different and interesting dynamics we might derive from looking just at religious cases. And Jacqueline might make that case and maybe Imtias makes a case for a different set of cases. Ultimately, we are all just trying to interpret uh, certain behaviors and observations uh, that we can make as academics. No one is in the brain of a justice. No one knows what's really going on when they take their decisions. So the best we can do is to ultimately try to derive certain uh, conclusions from these observations. And, and um, you know, Imtias is the one who's really in the courtroom and really uh, dealing with these justices and lawyers uh, make a hobby out of reading the mind of a justice. At the end of the day, uh, we are all interpreting. And I think that's important that we bring different evidence to the table. Thank you. Um, let me, let me uh, uh, take this question from Greg. He says, if judges are selected uh, based on the way they think, for example, uh, promotions, whether they support the government of the day and so on, uh, to what extent is ethnicity uh, relevant? Does ethnicity matter? Uh, maybe let me bundle that question and direct this to Imtias, right? Because we've spoken a little bit about the Judicial Appointments Commission, and you've suggested that this also needs some kind of a reform. So very, very quickly, maybe you can outline how these judges are appointed uh, under the current system. Because in fact, when the JAC was first proposed, uh, we in Singapore thought this was a great idea, except that um, when you look at the way in which it has actually uh, worked out, it was a, a better idea on paper than it is in practice. So maybe you, you could say a little bit about that and then address uh, Greg's question. Yeah, um, so in terms of ethnicity, um, all I can say is, is what I see uh, at the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the, and the Federal Court. And what we do see uh, for, for various reasons and not necessarily the wrong reasons uh, is um, an overwhelmingly uh, higher number of Malay judges um, at all, all levels than you do uh, non-Malay judges. Um, and then you have to break it down further. So for example, in the High Court, um, if you 
do judicial review work where a lot of this public law work, um, disputes, public law disputes end up. The judges who are uh, appointed to those courts, you'll have to look at what the ethnicity of those judges uh, are as well, if, if you are going down that line. So I, I can say this, that yes, there seems to be um, uh, a greater emphasis on uh, improving uh, ethnic diversity amongst the appointments, um, but there's, because of the legislation and how it's framed, um, the Judicial Appointments Commission is not required to make public um, its reasoning or its processes. So we're all left to wonder a little bit about how it is uh, decisions are made. And when we look back to the legislation and the Code of Ethics, which, which uh, sets out the criteria, the criteria is extremely broad um, and, and uh, in no way helpful to determining uh, specifically whether this judge or, or that judge um, uh, is qualified or not. Um, so all I can say is um, it, it was a good idea on paper. Um, uh, from the outset, the bar had issues with the way the legislation was drafted because, as I said earlier, uh, it has, um, it's weighted towards sitting justices um, and um, there's no process by which the recommendations are to be vetted or, or uh, accepted or otherwise. Um, the English model, I think, is a good one to look at because there you have um, uh, the majority being non-judges. Recommendations uh, are given. Uh, the various uh, authorities, be it the, the, the judge in charge of high court judges, court of appeal or, House, or Supreme Court, um, if they reject, must say why. Similarly, if the recommendation is made to the Prime Minister, ultimately puts it to the Queen. If he says no, he must say why in writing. And ultimately, those uh, rejection letters uh, uh, can be obtained through freedom of information challenges later. So that brings, uh, brings a certain level of transparency and accountability that because of the way the legislation has been framed in Malaysia, our system does not allow for. So, so I, think, I think, let me just say this very quickly. I found Beyond's paper very interesting because it helped me put certain um, uh, meat or, or give traction to certain notions I'd had um, about how things worked um, historically. And you know, one of the things that, that we're always confronted when we talk about these things is they say, well, where's your basis for saying it? So, for example, in all these religious cases, I mean, I think it's quite clear why in, in, at a certain time uh, decisions were going in a particular way. And, you know, it led to a lot of uh, civil society efforts to try and bring that into focus um, and, you know, the kind of controversy that erupted in. Um, it, it, but we never had an empirical basis to say, well, if you look at at least this data, on the face of it, there's a, there is a reason for us to maybe look at appointing judges a bit differently. And I would think that, you know, publications like, like Bjorn's would be very useful for, for the Judicial Appointments Commission to look at, to see whether they're on the right track, whether they should be looking at other factors and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, yes, Bjorn. Can, can I just jump in? I mean, I, I appreciated uh, Imtia's comments on the Judicial Appointments Commission. I mean, one question I have for you, Imtia, or for everyone on the panel is, Yes, there is more diversity, and in some ways we have to ask the question, why should the judiciary be diverse? I mean, in some ways, you know, we expect parliament to be diverse, to represent the nation, but, you know, if judges are really just judging by the law, we don't need an additional criteria of diversity. But I guess what Malaysia should also consider is why it is so hesitant to nominate outsiders to the bench. And what I mean by outsiders, I mean non-career judiciary, right? I mean, we don't see, like in other countries, efforts of nominating lawyers who have had a career in the private sector or a career in government uh, to the bench. And I think if it's a really constitutional chamber, these kind of people could play a quite important role in adjudicating these, uh, these matters. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's quite important that, you know, no matter what model we look at, you know, around the world, there are always certain problems and uh, some, some glitches with the appointments process. And it just highlights that we are dealing with a highly, ultimately political process. And the more there is at stake, the more there is an effort to control that process. Right? Well, we, we are running out of time and I know there are still a number of questions, some of them quite lengthy and require a, a more involved answer, but I, I can't possibly uh, 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 open them up. But I, I'll give the last uh, uh, shot to, to Jacqueline because you've suggested that we should take these 
various types of sort of uh, religion cases out of the equation when uh, uh, you know computing you know the data that that Bjorn has. Uh, what is your prognosis about these cases? If you once you take them out, right? Uh, because on the one hand, he seems to suggest that you know uh, religious cases end up being in favor of the government most of the time. But yet they are also in these same, very same cases in which the court appears to be uh, pushing the basic structure doctrine as well as emphasizing judicial power. So, uh, you know, is, is that not some, somewhat contradictory? I, thank you, Kevin. Um, I think this really goes to the sort of exchange that Bjorn was having with um, Andrew as well. So my point is that the religion cases, may, you may see, an, um, if you like, the, some of the propositions that Bjorn and um, Tomu uh, highlighted in your paper being accentuated, um, you know, ethnicity being a significant factor in how a particular judge may decide in a religion case because of the overlap between religion and ethnicity with regards to Malay Muslims in Malaysia. So I think that you will see and this being accentuated but my, I suppose my point is that to look at the religion cases distinctively allows us to see how it moves, how some of these accentuated points can result in some kind of turning point um, and perhaps allow us to ask the question of why. Why is it that Indira Gandhi was decided the way it did? Why is it that we see the federal court deciding the Bin Abdullah case in a particular way, why is it that we see the federal court granting leave to sisters in Islam to challenge these fatwas and the, Sharia, uh, and, and the uh, powers given to the Sharia court for judicial review? So my point is not that it is necessarily in contrast or contradicts the findings that um, Bjorn and Chumu have um, sort of highlighted, but to say that it is accentuated and therefore there is something quite distinctive about religion cases. Now, you know, it's also sort of very interesting, right? The case, you know, if you contrast the two cases that I mentioned, Ng Wan Chan versus Sun Sing, you see the high court judge deciding one way in an earlier case and then deciding another way when he becomes chief justice. So there's, it also speaks to, I suppose, a question about the pipeline, how people get promoted and so on. So it's fascinating to see, I think, within the religion cases, even within the religion cases, the divergences that individual judges undergo when they are at different stages of their career. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, our time is up. Unfortunately, you raised a really uh, uh, large number of very interesting questions that could be continuously debated. And uh, we watch uh, Malaysia with great, great interest. But thank you very much, uh, our dear guests today, Bjorn, Jacqueline, Imtiaz, uh, and for all of you who've joined us. And on behalf of uh, Ross at the ANU Malaysia Center, uh, this is uh, Kevin from the Center for Asian Legal Studies, thanking all of you for joining us. Thank you.